Well, hello everyone. Uh, this is uh, another episode of the Three Amigos in which we're gonna be talking about the seven step process for optimizing your business and preparing it for transition. Last week, Ed spoke about the overall and today Ron's gonna focus his uh, time on the market analysis, which is so important if you're gonna really optimize the business or prepare it for transition. Uh, Ron, uh, walk us through this. Uh, we're gonna be uh, interested to hear your take on how marketing analysis is so important. Sure, uh, I'd be happy to do that. Um, Peter Drucker always uh, has said, uh, a business is formed for uh, just two reasons. One is to find a customer, two is to innovate. Uh, other than that, everything else is just um, cost. So the, the things that make things happen are finding the customer and marketing, of course, and innovation, which actually uh, is a combination of uh, finance, but more engineering and more creativity even uh, than anything else. Um, and uh, we won't really touch much on that subject, but I think I've made the point. That's why we're talking about the customer comes first to follow up on, on Ed's comments uh, uh, last week. So um, let's get started. Um, the, uh, we're, we're, we're continuing on with our strategic business solutions using Ed's seven step process. And this process, uh, those of you who saw the last one will recall or, or others will recall, we've got these seven different things. We talked a lot about valuations, assessments and analysis last time. And so, uh, as Ray said, we're going to talk about the analysis side of the market. So keep in mind that when we say market, and we're talking about customers, future customers, existing customers, that it all has to do with how you're going to interface your market. Okay, so the value wheel, which are the eight drivers, Ed's eight drivers are, um, uh, you know, really good activities. Each one of these activities can drive your value, your company valuation higher. Um, and what we're going to talk about is uh, the, several of these, not all of these in complete, uh, in a complete way, but just to say that the marketing functions cover uh, three of them plus half or some portion of two more. So uh, marketing is a bigger part of the uh, equation than a lot of people think. Many times the strategic planning stays in the finance accounting an operational realm uh, without really looking at the marketing side. And yet you can see how uh, Ed's eight drivers are really, about half maybe, are really driven by um, market-based activities and market-based evaluations. Uh, so in, in the, the way that we, we want businesses to succeed uh, is to kind of jump out of the old style of say strategic planning and not just look at the numbers, but also really look at the market because outside of content uh, of uh, efficiency uh, and small incremental improvements, which are wonderful, the real jumps in business uh, come from finding better and, and penetrating markets. That's where uh, I think in, in my 35 years of helping companies you know, grow pretty fast, uh, that's where we've made the, the difference. It, it wasn't in, in uh, tweaking many of the other pieces. It was really finding and penetrating markets. So that's what we're going to talk about. So really, uh, to continue on with uh, the same format, step 1B, uh, the, the customer always comes first. We're going to talk about market analysis and positioning. And uh, the, the, the two main things that we do here is analyze financial statements. That's the official scorecard, which Ed started last time. So we're kind of number two here, which is market analysis and, and position in the market. There are uh, four basic pieces to that. One is customer analysis. And we're talking about uh, customers you already have, internal customers, and what we'll call external customers. <clears throat> which could be uh, prospects. Sometimes people will throw in uh, suppliers and 
uh, and team members in, in that. But let's, we, we, we don't want to, we don't want to discount the team, but we're really talking about strategic planning in the marketing area today. <clears throat> a competitive analysis. A lot of people just look inside at their own business, and, and I think there's some validity at that. Uh, one of one of my mentors uh, in a, in a national consulting firm, the the guy who trained uh, 120 20 field analysts, always used to say, uh, "Pay attention to your own business, uh, or mind your own business and mind it well." And what he meant by that is, if you take a look, we were a company that did did inventory planning and of uh, and. Uh, uh, open to buy planning, primarily for retail, uh, especially stores. And the point was, if you really watch the movement of your own products and your own inventory, you can actually uh, move your business forward. That's a form of strategic planning, by the way. <clears throat> and um, that tells you where to go and how much money to spend in certain categories of merchandise. But that that's, you know, there are lots of other kinds of businesses like manufacturers and service providers that 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 is you know doesn't work quite the same for but um uh in this particular case i think most businesses will look at a competitive analysis because you want to look outside yourself and find out who you're competing with and what the prices are um it's valid in retail as well um but um uh, then the market a full market analysis is really not looking at competitors but looking at the market characteristics itself and then, of course, market positioning, I'll explain when we get there, which is the last sort of piece of strategic planning. So briefly, I just want to throw this out, uh, put it in the back of your mind, is that uh, the marketing cycle is a continuous process to really plan and execute uh, the, all of the marketing functions. And uh, to do this, I've always used and developed uh, this marketing uh, planning cycle where we start with customers at the top, do our analysis over in this planning section, customers um, and com competitors, uh, as well as the market, and then, and then competencies. Because remember, every single uh, time you are trying to build, say, a positioning statement uh, or trying to, trying to find a new customer, you're always matching the competencies your company has with the market itself with your customers and i don't know of any marketing people who have ever taken a look at company competencies uh to determine if they had what happens usually is that the salesman comes back they say why couldn't you sell our machine you know q and he says uh gee um they wanted q a and we don't have the the ability to make the a model and they're going well then how we should do that how should we do it and they don't even think about the fact that they can't they 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 haven't in their, they can't enter that sub market because they don't have the competency to do it so it, it does drive companies to become competent in new areas um uh, but it, competency is a major part of strategic planning uh targeting is a is an old term that is uh, used just to say who your customer is going to be uh, that is, in a way, supplanted by positioning, but you, you really do both of these at the same time. Now, these you can see that half of the activities for marketing are analysis and, and, and planning. This is part of strategic planning. If you do not do these things, then you're only doing half of the planning process. Uh, and these are the things that actually increase business a lot. Uh, it's not the execution. It's not writing it's not uh, doing more social media. It's all how you position everything based on the research. And then the final step is to analyze how you did, make corrections, and do it again. Uh, so let's I, get before yeah. you leave that slide, if you don't mind. Uh, sure. It's one of the one of the current topics that you might address a little bit, and I don't know if it's beyond uh, this, but you know, yesterday Facebook changed their name. Yeah. Right. Big deal. <clears throat> And yeah, it's a big deal. And as you were going through this, Ron, I was thinking, what was it that, that um, from your perspective as an outsider looking in, 
how how would they have gone through this? And did you see that as being a part of their process? You know, why change the name? Yeah, I think I think they went through each one of these uh, in some fashion or another. Now I will say that Facebook is still still driven by its uh, founder. Okay. Uh, he still he still has most of uh, the largest block of stock, so he kind of gets to say what he wants. So in many ways, this is not a typical corporate kind of a business, even though they've okay. got lots and lots of corporate people. Even so, uh, his, the people around him would be pushing him to say, "Who are our customers?" And I got to tell you, nobody knows more about customers than Facebook. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, they know everything. They know everything. Uh, that they want to know about the 20% um, uh, of their customers that provide 80% of the eyeballs to their site. Okay. They, they follow them. They know very, very well. Uh, yeah. They, they understand, whoops, I'm so sorry. They understand their competition really well uh, because they've driven most of them out of business or bought them. Right. Uh, so they've, they've made themselves number one in the marketplace. They have a lot of latitude, but they're looking to the future and they're saying, uh, this is a technical company. Things are changing very, very fast. And they know that there is this new sort of three-dimensional. They bought Oculus uh, not too long ago, which is a, you know, a virtual reality company. Uh, they, know, <clears throat> they know that this three-dimensional spatial um, social interface is going to continue to grow because technology is growing there. So they're looking at their competencies and they're saying, do we have the ability to do it? Well, they bought several other companies that have the ability. So now they do. And um, in looking at the uh, this morning um, in looking at the announcement he made, you know, he's throwing this virtual reality stuff where they're they're taking individual people. You get to build a meme that looks kind of like yourself or an avatar. And, uh, uh, and basically, you can interface now with your friends and mm -hmm. do it in a third dimension, if you will. Right. Um, this is a big, big step. It's also a fairly big gamble. But so now, based on however they came to that decision and however they felt as though they had to go there, uh, you know, which would be nice to, to know, someday right. maybe we will know they figured they their targeting is the whole world and so that's simple and then you get down to positioning and they're saying how can we do virtual reality uh this you know multiple dimensional thing um in this we want to be in this metaverse this multi-layered sort of artificial place that it takes reality and throws it together um, how does Facebook book, um, communicate that new idea? And their marketing people said, you know what? It's going to be a hindrance from now on. Facebook implies uh, your face, an individual person, some pictures of yourself and, uh, you know, some, um, some uh, you know, locations where you are and maybe your cat and in other words, it's a very personal kind of thing. It's a, it's really a, in in high technology, it's an old world idea, and this new <laughs> idea, really, yeah, I know, it's a little bizarre. Yeah, that's right. It's right. It's thirty years old, and yet it's old, old. You know? Yeah, and so, so there are people who, from a marketing positioning perspective, said we have to reposition ourselves in the market for something new, and and the best way to do that is to rebrand ourselves. Okay. And so now you get to, well, we want to control the metaverse. Therefore, let's call ourselves meta. And yeah. There you go. There okay. You go. Yeah. Very interesting. And I thought it was, I thought it would be good to get your insights on this because it's really taking this model and applying it to a real life situation we're currently living with. Yeah, no, that, that that's right. And, and the, the, uh, the approach we happen to use and have developed over the years, you know, it's, it may not have been done by these professionals in exactly the same way, uh, but you can bet that they have departments of strategic marketing people for each one of these things. Yeah. Um, and they've got a whole marketing team that are doing this, which is decidedly different than a small company. 
Yeah. Almost yeah. no small companies have a dedicated marketing strategist. Um, uh, and uh, at the risk of offending some people, most marketing professionals are pretty decent at targeting uh, content and communication, but they have no idea how to do the other stuff. Right. Um, they're, they're not strategic in nature. That's just the way, the way it seems to be. So, yeah, yeah, Thank good, you. good, good point. Okay. So when we get into the customer analysis as the first piece, we go through, uh, you know, several, several different views of the customer, you know, what's the composition of revenue across customer type industry contribution margin. Um, you want to recognize there's a little difference, by the way, between a, a B2B versus a consumer, uh, a C2B customer, B2B, C2B, um, business to business versus customer, consumer uh, are two kinds of businesses. But many of these analyses are similar. It's just that you're looking at companies in one and individual consumers in another. So you want to know who your revenue by customer is. Um, Normally, the Prado principle is in play where about 20% of your customers uh, generate about 80% of your, your revenue. It's important to know that. Um, uh, we have um, charts that help you figure out if you happen to be a composition of 1090, that's a little different than say 30 or 40 to 60, because that means your customer base is different. They have different characteristics that tells you something about your aggregate customers. You want to know profit by customer. Now, a lot, many times, and more often these days, we get this contribution margin uh, by group of customers or down to the customer. Uh, but it's really hard to get customer uh, profit by customer simply because of the composition of fixed and variable expenses and the way accounting is normally done. Um, but uh, the future is cost accounting. Uh, some businesses do that now, particularly manufacturers, but the future is to know how much every customer actually delivers to the bottom line. Ongoing revenue, uh, you know, what's the profile um, of the people who uh, have a reason to come back to your business? Uh, that's called stickiness by some. And um, how sticky is that customer to your business based on whether or not they need to buy parts from you? Uh, you know, how, how many processes uh, do you have that are really truly unique that they need and those kinds of things and whether or not it's recurring revenue to one time sale. You want to know your potential additional business. This is why we look at the market. <clears throat> how many customers do you have? What percentage of the market is that and how many are left that you can still go sell? That's really important. And this is where the big leaps are made is understanding where the potential of your business is as opposed to hunkering down and looking inside your business all the time and this can be a big a, a big problem uh, for many owners that are so busy operating their business they can't ever look outside and then of course you want a feedback loop it's interesting people think they know their customers um, um, it's my experience after 35 years of doing hundreds of customer analyses that very, very, very few businesses actually have robust feedback loops, meaning they do regular surveys, they look up their ratings, they uh, have a organized way to collect and analyze complaints, they collect sales comments from their sales group. So a feedback loops, very, very key, and you, many people call it a customer, customer service, but that feedback loop becomes strategic in this particular case. Uh, then some people will go through and, and actually create a customer rating and say, well, we've got A, B, C, D customers. Uh, of course, we won't get into it today, but you wanna be careful not to treat the B or C customers uh, uh, substantially different because that may be the future growth of your business. Mm. Focusing just on your say A customers can can be a way of increasing profit today and decreasing it tomorrow. The second one is uh, customer analysis. I don't know why this is underlined, sorry about that. Uh, market to position ranking. This is um, when we're looking at the competitor, excuse me, competitor analysis, we wanna know 
Uh, well, how big is the market uh, in dollars? Hopefully that's hard to measure for small markets. I, I recognize this is not easy to do, but if you can, you continue to work on how big is your market and how much of that market does your competitor own? You want to rank those who are dominant for second and third uh, and then the rest because there are metrics which we can't go into today which show how success happens for the first second and third the also rands end up being pretty uh, much starved because they can't achieve the same um contribution margins that the first second and third can and therefore they don't fund their business as well and they can't keep up so ultimately they fall off this is why markets consolidate when they become mature we use the value diamonds to look at competitors uh, as well as what our customers think of us in other words customer perceptions of value i'm not talking about company value i'm talking about how does a customer value your product uh, this includes quality, price, service, and image, and you compare that against the customers. Uh, then you can identify the strengths and weaknesses there, and then you can rate and, and rank those areas. Uh, we use a tool called the value diamond in order to do this. And you can see quality is up here. It's a little small, but quality is at the top, service on the left, uh, price is on the right, and image down below image really represents all of brand uh all of the intangibles goodwill and a variety of um uh, visual and non-visual psychological actually um attitudes about a company so many of these models use quality service and price uh I was never able to do predictive analysis until image was thrown in <clears throat> because you do have a big difference uh, the number one, say, uh, business in a uh, ranked business in a market may be number one, either because they are have the highest quality at the best price, or because they're the low cost producer and they 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 have really good quality at a very low price. <clears throat> so those those things can happen. Um, so what this does is this gives us an opportunity to. Uh, simply get with your key people, your, including, say, your sales manager, your VPs, uh, owners, because you kind of know your basic competitors. And you compare two or three of your competitors to yourself. It's amazing how close you can get when you just do a simple, you know, one to 10 rating or one to five rating. What this does then is it says where you're strong and where you're weak. And this, this helps you to um, prioritize the areas you need to work on. So many companies, especially manufacturers, make the um, mistake of spending huge amounts of money on continuous quality improvement uh, because they may maybe they're an eight here. Now you, you might you might argue this guy down at six really does need some some quality improvement, but say you're an eight and you're compared to a nine. Uh, this is a major major cultural thing and expensive thing and slow thing to improve. Uh, quality is, uh, especially in engineered products, very, very difficult to improve. But then on the other hand, you may find that working on image is really something that is easy to do. And you can actually improve your sales by spending your time here or even in service. So what it does is it helps you understand where you're weak. If, uh, if you happen to have a low image uh, like this particular one here, um, you know, you may really work on that first because you have a big climb everywhere and you may want to try to make sure, you know, and it can be something simple like uh, uh, so, so many small professional uh, uh, um, uh, blue collar businesses, plumbers, et cetera, you know, or they, they manufacture something that's engineered. They just think that putting it on a piece of paper and handing it out is just fine because every, they think everybody makes decisions based on the specifications. Well, I'm here to tell you after studying this for 35 years, that is so much baloney. 
because even engineers and accountants are influenced visually. They can't help it. Uh, we, we are all psychological beings and you cannot help it. So there is some kind of image that goes along with everything you do in your business. Uh, so going back then um, to the market analysis, um, we want to look at the uh, actual market and define this exact niche that the, for the company and the products. Um, some products can have multiple markets, but um, you, want, you do want to identify the top four competitors and uh, make some comparisons. You also want to look at market trends. Uh, those are changes in the trends, changes in technology, changes in volume, vulnerabilities, downside, to determine if your market is going to change on you. Uh, it, it, many, many markets send out signals that you should be able to identify. Uh, you may not think so after COVID because nobody expected that. Um, by the same token, uh, that's not the kind of issue that normally comes up. And, Many times you can't identify what's coming around the corner. Uh, look really closely for disrupting product services and trends. Uh, those are really fatal. Uh, if you are in the wrong place and you do the, do the wrong thing and don't keep up, your entire business goes away. And we could come up with a whole bunch of uh, examples. The buggy whip is, is the one that people always use. But take a look at the obsolete obsolescence of things just you know we know about i mean where's the fax machine today you know sorry don't need a fax anymore and um that's so true of so many technical things and when you take a look at a cell phone versus uh you know versus just a few years ago huge huge differences yeah so you wanna, I can, I, go ahead I was, I was just gonna make an observation i think you know, talking about this change in trends, et cetera, um, Steve Job, Jobs was really resistant to putting a phone in, you know, his, his iPod, you know, because he thought, why would you want a phone in an iPod? And it took his uh, marketing people and his uh, six months to convince him that this would be a good move. Um, and look where it's taken them, you know. So well, it's, yeah, it changed. It, it really changed the company. Yeah, um, it did, well, it, it disrupted the entire uh, world of technology. Well, it did. It absolutely did. And uh, uh, the now six months is a pretty short time, really. So I'm, you know, I'm not sure if that was a huge failure of his. Um, but he, he he identified and executed so many changes. Um, you know, not only was it the computer and, and right. the iPod, but it was the iPad, right. it was it was um, Macintosh. It was DreamWorks, you know, right. I mean, when he was not there, he did DreamWorks. It's hard for me to imagine that um, uh, Steve Jobs did not have an eye on that market. So um, I'm sure there are a lot of people who gave him input, but he was the kind of a guy that uh, um, forged ahead on his own. So. I'm sure there are a lot of stories now that he's gone that so and so is more important than you know Steve's job thought he was and you know so right, it's hard right. to, it's hard to know what really happened there but that's you're right what what perfect example so you want to identify the market maturity and when it's going to hit its life cycle um, if you were Ericsson phone you should have you know clearly looked forward to determine where you were going and what the market could bring. If you were BlackBerry, you really should have looked mm. at that to determine that you were not going to be relevant anymore. Uh, if you, uh, if somebody could squeeze a computer into something the same size, yeah, uh, they they tried uh, to move there. I don't think that they missed the technology. I think they didn't have the financial capability um, or the um, capacity well the competency they didn't have the competency yeah. that apple had see this is a case where competency wins as well right. uh, yeah it's funny if i can uh, inject something you know i i had followed as you know uh, nokia very closely yeah and in, in around 2000 they had over 25 percent of the marketplace but right. because of the things you said 
they lost almost all of it simply because they didn't they didn't see the trends and they weren't able to keep up with the disruptions that were happening around them. Yeah. And who who thinks of that now? You know, it's like, really, they had 25 percent. You know, well, who are they? You know, yeah, 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 I mean, yeah it's, exactly. It's really yeah. it's really amazing how that how that can happen. Yeah. Um, so then number three, define your target market. That's uh, something that you, you want to try and focus in on the customers that are going to be as easy as possible to sell, that you're going to love your product and represent a pretty good piece of the market. You don't want to just go after everybody. You know, this idea of mass marketing is long gone and long over. And that was the idea that you have three media and you can reach the whole country if you just do national advertising. Um, we have, you know, I don't know, a thousand times more products than we had then. And the markets have broken down into these almost infinite numbers of small niche markets. You need to define your target market by looking at your niche market. And then finally, in your market analysis, you want to identify the company market positioning and market emplacement. Uh, these are terms that I'll only be able to basically um, discuss in a very basic way. Um, you you want to you do your pos positioning sort of as, as the last step and that's where you you bring all of your strategic planning together and you make decisions about the markets you're going to enter in the products that you're going to use market emplacement is more of a physical thing if you're in the retail business you want to be on the best corner but there are other physical issues too um, you can be in a, a physical market and have a, a river in between you and your major market and the bridge goes out and your market went away. So, and there are other types, but we don't really have enough, enough uh, ways to, enough time to talk about that because that's a pretty detailed kind of discussion. Then you want to try to identify what you think your competitors have done if they have done any marketing positions or, or marketing in placement. And then finally, looking at looking inside at yourself, company competency. Uh, this is, as I mentioned, match, matching the market need with your competency or your ability to do a variety of things. You want to ask questions like, what are the skill sets of the company? And by this, we are, most of the time we'll talk about as the, the three amigos here, we'll talk about without the owner. What can your company do without the owner? Yeah. Uh, what unique and patented products and processes does the company have? There are companies that are awfully loosey goosey about their competencies and they don't care if other people know what they do. Uh, this is a bad idea, especially with the Chinese stealing everything they can. Um, can the team complete these competencies uh, without ownership directing them? So, and I, I, may, I, I made mention of that before. Which competencies are actually unique? Um, how many of the functions that you do in a business are unique to your company? It's surprising how few. There are not very many things. You know, if you've got a machine uh, shop that you're and you're making a certain machined part, the vast majority of the steps that are necessary to do that are known by the entire, uh, say, community of um, machinists. Uh, there are specialty issues where you're working on certain kinds of things and you get better at that. But what are those? And are you taking advantage of the unique people that do unique things in your product development? Many times uh, you just assume that, well, these person do it, they do a nice job, but you don't think about how you differentiate your product using those uh, unique tools or unique competencies uh, and <clears throat> which unique which are actually unique how do these competencies fit in that market niche what opportunities in the market are created using these competencies and what additional competencies meaning people skills equipment um, that need to be developed in order for you to be able to have a competencies for that uh, that new feature on your existing product for that extension market or, or product extension that you need to have in order to follow your niche market and be able to satisfy your customer tomorrow. 
Uh, Ron, I wanted yeah. to bring something else up here that that's kind of uh, related to this, but it's also uh, it's also a broader perspective of what marketing is and knowing your competitors, etc. Only this week we learned that the Chinese have developed these hypersonic missiles, yeah. and um, you know uh, General Miley called them a Sputnik moment, in which you know obviously they didn't steal our technology; they built on it in ways that we're not even prepared to do. I'm using that as an example only because I think, you know, in knowing the competitors, it's important to understand what their capabilities are. And I appreciate your putting these competencies in here because if we don't really understand the competency of our competitor, we may find ourselves as we have here on a national level. Yeah, and you're, you're right to bring that <laughs> up as a really a terrific uh, example. And uh, talk about disruption, uh, kind of catching us with our pants down. Um, uh, potentially devastating effect of that. And in a much, much, much smaller way, the same thing can happen to an individual company where somebody just comes up with something. And, and especially if you can't figure out how to duplicate it. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, that now it's hard to do. Um, and it takes creative people, uh, sometimes very, very technical people to be able to do those things. Um, but uh, creating new products and in, in, in creating new markets is for uh, a whole group of, of creative folks uh, who are good at doing that. Many times owners are pretty good at that. And, um, but when you get a little bit bigger, the bigger companies are not so good. And uh, they spend huge amounts of money hiring creatives and engineers and so forth to be able to do these things and they end up with a whole bunch of stuff that doesn't matter. Um, and then they finally get something that fits a market. The problem is, is that these scientist types never talk to the market folks. Yeah, right. Uh, so you get a big company, they're disjointed, and they're just kind of all going out doing their own thing. When it, when you have someone driving it, and so examples, uh, Steve Jobs yes, drove, yeah. drove the market creation. Um, right. And, and, and we, we talked about Facebook and, and Meta uh, today, uh, new Meta. Well, that's being driven, uh, most likely being, being driven. And so, you know, a lot of companies, the Tesla is being driven. And, um, and until recently, Amazon was being driven by Jeff Bezos. And so, you know, there's, there are people at the top who drive your technical people into these cracks because they're they have the ability to see these cracks yeah and, and force all of their people to get together and accomplish things so yeah. big companies have been pretty good at doing this in the highly technical stuff um small companies have to find little teeny pieces that they can partake of but you also have to remember that many times you can take a little piece and a big company sees it and simply takes it because they have the competency too. Um, that's happening today, say with webmasters. We've talked a little bit about this. The competency of HTML is no longer required and uh, anybody now can, almost anybody can go to GoDaddy and build a website. So um, the big GoDaddy is taking all and, and beating up all these little businesses where they had, you know, two or, two or three webmasters, they're forced into little cracks. And those cracks are sustained by special coding and software or um, industrial knowledge. And so right. you have to be able to do that. You can't be a generalist and, and be a very successful web company. Yeah, very good example. Yeah. How much uh, success of a company and, and their strategic plan is predicated upon competencies and mm -hmm. whether they match a need in the market so you have to be able to understand what your competencies are but you also have to figure out a marketing aspect to it a need in the marketplace right um, because you're going to be assembling uh, people technology um, all kinds of costs associated I would call it more investments in the company. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to be making these investments, you want to make sure you have a, hard, a high ROI 
um, not a low ROI. And I would think if you read it the wrong way, you could go out of business pretty quickly. Uh, well, you're absolutely right. Uh, and that kind of brings up an old debate. And that is, um, are you going to be product driven or market driven? And uh, in the marketing circles, we talk about product driven, meaning, you know, you, you sell a certain set of chemicals. And so what you do is you take your product and go out and you look for a look for somebody to sell those chemicals to. As opposed to a market where you go to the market and you, you ask the question, what does the market need? And then you develop the chemicals that the market needs. So um, I, I tend to be on the market driven side of things. So uh, if you are a market driven company, then you do pay attention to the market, the market niche and all the things I've talked about here. And then you go back to your competencies and you see how your competencies fit. Uh, when I mentioned large companies having, you know, chemists, scientists, engineers working on all kinds of things, they're given a certain amount of latitude, which I think is a good thing, but it doesn't mean that there's going to be a market and that's why they work on many thousands of things. You know, the, the number of things that come to the market from a large company is, is since single digits, I'm sure. So they, they're, they're very poor at satisfying a market. Uh, in working with many of my industrial clients over the years, and then working with their vendors who many times were, you know, Fortune 500 companies, it was always interesting to see them come in and some of them would ask questions uh, because they want to develop a relationship, but they didn't very often ask questions about what are you going to do and what kinds of things can we sell you in the future? They asked about how can we improve our, who, who are you looking at that we might, might be my, our competitor that we don't see? Um, they're, they're, so, you know, they're, again, they're disjointed, but I, I think that you have to combine the, the strategic marketing uh, folks with the uh, salespeople in them, and then also allow them to drive conversation with the science people, uh, that doesn't happen because they're not the science people, the engineers do not respect the marketing. People. Yeah, uh, I think I was thinking of, uh, you know, three, three examples that were, we've discussed two of them already. You know, when you, when you look at how Steve Jobs, you know, figured out how to make the connection between the product that he was developing and the marketplace. And then you look at uh, uh, today's version is, is Tesla. And, and Elon Musk, you know, mm -hmm. it just astounds me at how he's able to figure out these uh, market niche by, by understanding the competency of what he has, but also looking at the future. And then, of course, Amazon with Bezos, you know, uh, it, it's, it, it, to me, it's kind of astounding. This is, this is an example of creativity that you were talking about earlier, Ron, that's, that's pretty unique. You know, there are not, not very many people have this capacity. Yeah, that, that is true. And, and I, it would probably be worth mentioning that uh, there are a whole lot of companies that do do very well um, and uh, they go in and do the same thing very well day after day after day, which is an absolutely necessary piece of maintaining quality in customer service and all the things that your regular day to day customers uh, expect from you. Right. Um, so, you know, I don't want to minimize that in any way, shape or form. That's really, really key. But by the same token, doing a breakthrough strategy uh, requires a certain kind of a person. And it's possible, but it's extremely rare that it comes in one body. Yeah. Um, you, you're talking about some people, uh, some of them, what? Bezos amazes me. He is an incredible numbers guy. He is a good analyst. He is a programmer. He understands his stuff. And he did one simple thing, and that is that he recognized as an individual person, um, as some of us did, uh, uh, back when Prodigy came out, that this was going to be something amazing. We didn't understand that it was going to evolve into <clears throat> the World Wide Web, meaning the, the HTML that was used to visually communicate with people uh, necessarily. We just knew that this was going to be a big thing. It helped him uh, create 
a, uh, a business and it helped me create a business. Yeah. Um, in, the, in his case, he had a large entrepreneurial approach and that is, I see the technology and now I'm going to find a market that this would work for. And he studied several industries and he picked books and he was right about that. Mm. Once he perfected books and how to sell them, you know, I mean, literally, you know, you make, you make, it makes, it seems like it's impossible today, but literally he used to drive the books from his garage to the post office. Wow. So uh, this is a guy that, that had a vision, knew he had to execute very well because to be competitive when nobody knew what this was, it had to be extraordinary, but he also understood programming and they invested almost all of their money in software. Wow. The first several years because he knew it had to. And once he had figured that out, he knew that was, it was just a matter of funding and, and hiring the very, very best people he could to go after each market. And he carefully went after um specific you know electronics was next right he, right he, he picked specific markets that he knew that he could he could uh, store and ship easily etc right. so he's a he's one of the really rare examples where he understands both business very well and he understands the, the market strategy very well but yeah. he saw the market and he built the company to go to the market that's why he was successful Wow, that's good. And I think you can say the same thing about Tesla's uh, company as well. Yeah, and I mean, uh, uh, Musk is just yeah, he's also yeah. it's just amazing the, you know, when you look at the breadth of what what he he gets involved in. You know. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's he's an extraordinary person, but but most people think he's he's a technical genius. I think he's a market genius. Yeah. Yeah. He finds the technology. He sees what he wants. He knows what he wants to deliver to the to the customer, and he finds the people to deliver that. Yeah. He didn't. He didn't do all of the all the design work for Tesla. He doesn't no. do all the design work for rockets. You know. He he recognized that things were changing in the space business. He's recognized that we need a strategy, a way to bore more holes in order to be able. To uh, build tunnels, uh, right, right, for transportation. Yeah. So I mean, he sees the market. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's just it's it's really kind of amazing. So yeah, it is. You know, and and I think if I can say this, I mean, you know, your analysis here helped us better appreciate, you know, how people like, you know, these these icons of business today, but also how a smaller business can apply the same principles mm -hmm. and then move into the PIMs one, two, or three in their region or their area or their discipline. Yeah, right. And of course, that's that's exactly where this came from. All of uh, all that you've seen that I've developed over the last thirty years uh, came from a need to solve the problem for the small business because I was educated uh, how to market in a big business um, where you have all kinds of resources and tools and academics and you got a lot of tools in a big business to do your market analysis and you got a lot of statisticians and folks to do that but how does a small company do it uh these tools are developed for small companies to to try to be as competitive in their small niche market uh as possible and of course what's important here again is it's the niche that's important and it's the the, the way you fit your products in the niche because you cannot be a telephone company and hope to compete with uh, the big ones. Yeah, I had a friend who tried, by the way, uh, that didn't go very well. Right. <laughs> so, so sort of summing this up a little bit, the, the market strategy really can't be completed until this discovery is done. You have to go through these analyses and um, to to do so is sort of to to miss them is puts this at your peril you know your, your company at peril now you take all of that and you combine it with the financial strength of your firm the investment you need your team capabilities uh and and, and of course operations that are required in order to really make this thing happen and so that's why it's so important to put all the pieces together 
it's now at the point where you've done all of these things that you're ready to do market positioning statement and a marketing emplacement statement. N then you can define your company uh, and how it interfaces with customers, the products, the niche and brand. Uh, in in you're you're now you're now finally ready to start marketing and selling uh, your successfully using the execution phases. So what this really is is saying is that you are shooting you're shooting in the dark until you've completed the strategy. And so uh, in in my career. Whenever I've said people to people I do marketing, um, they they recognize that the vast majority of professional marketers um, fail. Uh, not only do they fail in terms of their own businesses, but they fail uh, for the clients that they're trying to help. The reason is they do not do what we've just talked about. Uh, that's what it gives uh, marketers a sort of a, a uh, dirty salesman person kind of uh, image. And because we're lumped into the same category and marketers look for the market, salesmen go sell to the target market if it's right. a successful company. So uh, we've just gone through the marketing execution plan. Uh, the customer analysis is used to drive targeting Competitive analysis is used to uh, look at the competitive value along with the competencies. Uh, and then you finally get to marketing position. And as I said, now you execute. So you've done half of the work, the execution, uh, half of the mental work anyway. Then the execution may last for six months, a year, two years, three years. Uh, and you're going to make some changes and you're going to come back around and reevaluate. Um, but uh, in measuring in between. But this, the red, is what people think marketing is. Yeah. That's why it doesn't work. So that's, uh, that's the strategic part of marketing. I, I can tell you, Ron, that, that presentation was unbelievable. Well, thank and you. It, uh, it makes... It makes me wonder why more small businesses don't do these kind of things because they they find something that works now they have a niche and they 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 just keep running that niche forever without ever refining retooling reanalyzing and eventually uh, the revenue starts to plummet yeah and it's too late it's then to turn everything around it's yeah. too it's it's too bad and um uh there are i think there are a bunch of reasons and we've touched on on probably most of them uh a, you know a, a business owner just gets stuck in the day-to-day -day grind yep. and operations and chasing after problems and fixing this and fixing that and 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 don't delegate and they don't run it so that you know they're trying to put themselves out of a job they run it as if they're the essential person they're stuck it becomes an ego business. I know yeah. how to do it. Oh, I do it the best. Uh, get out of the way. Let me show you how to do it again. Um, instead of making sure that your people can stand on their own and they, they become good workers and good managers themselves. So a business can succeed for a while. Um, and as we've talked about in terms of trying to increase the valuation of your business, many businesses are for sale because they have kind of come to their end the end of their rope they yeah. they haven't been able to grow their business and they, uh, they yeah they value the business based upon past cash flows rather than pre, uh, future cash flows right because the future cash flows aren't gonna stay unless they do different things mm -hmm. look at things differently make investments in the products and the services that they provide. Yeah. So turning that around, when you're looking at a business to buy, if you can find something you have some expertise in that you can take the basic uh, fundamentals of what they're doing in their existing business and try to figure out how to amplify um, opportunities 
related to future marketing uh, 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 markets out there, it, there, that's where the real value is in the future. You and I think, it's, right. I, yeah. I think it's a real problem to, to assume that just because you made a certain profit margin for the last five uh, years that it's going to continue to the next five years. Well, yeah, right. Especially if you bought BlackBerry on its best day, right? Yeah, absolutely. You <laughs> yeah, kind of right. think you don't know what you don't know and you kind of think it's going to just continue. Yeah. So well, if, you think... can't, if you can't show, you know, five or six years of continuous uh, decent increases in revenue, uh, you, you know, you really could argue, what have you got to sell here? Okay, you've got some equipment. Do you have competencies that are worth buying? Have you got people right. who will stay? You can try and buy all that stuff. But without the things we've just talked about, there's really no future you're buying. Therefore, you, the buyer has to create its, his own future. And uh, if they're good at understanding these things, they would be able to take these basic competencies at a pretty low price and turn them into something that would be a good return on investment simply because they understand the marketing strategy piece of marketing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I ran, into an at, investment, uh, ran into an investment banker this week and his analysis of whether to buy a business or not was to walk through the floor and find 25% of uh, reduction in costs. And I'm thinking to myself, Boy, that's a pretty shallow way of looking at it. Right. Because really when it comes right down to the value is the product and services that you provide to your customers. That's correct. And right. it all starts with the customer. Right. And, and many of those folks who say, we're going to go in and we're going to lean this company down. And that's because they're going to turn around and sell it at a higher value later. Right. Not much later. A couple well, of years later. But if going, back, going back to your diamond, mm -hmm. um, the quality, the service, and uh, the reputation mean so much. And in the short run, bean counters or uh, ill-advised uh, managers can reduce costs, make the profit look good in the short term, but they're going to diminish the, the future quality, image, and services of the company. Right. And that's a real that's a real problem. If you're trying to buy a company that doesn't have good quality, good service and a decent image, what are you really buying? Well, that's right. Somebody said uh, in something I was reading the other day that uh, if uh, Coca-Cola went broke tomorrow, you wouldn't care about the company itself. You would just want to have the recipe and the logo because you could rebuild Coca-Cola in the same to the same size it is today because anybody can bottle anybody can make uh, can put these things together and anybody can figure out distribution the only thing they have is their logo and their recipe right. and, and of course the the brand that goes along with it people know right. what it is they know what it tastes like that's what they want um so that that really shows that there's not much i mean sure you, scrap value for all of their bottling plants that's fine but really it's scrap value at that point without the logo and the recipe they don't have anything yeah you know i was just uh, kind of as a as a wrap-up i was thinking you know we, here we talked about musk bezos and and job and each one of those people figured out that if you're going to succeed you have to leave somebody who can run the business so they can do something new and different and i think that's what i heard from this is that you know, the good owners are out there and analyzing the marketplace to know better what they have to do and what they don't. And if they don't do that, they miss all these opportunities that, that yeah. better companies do. Right. And what they try to do, they, they try to stay involved in the day to day because that way they think they're saving money because they don't have to replace themselves. And in reality, they're missing out on the future opportunities of the company. Right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, great uh, presentation. Uh, Fabulous. You know, Thank we, you. Uh, uh, we hope that if you've been watching, you know, that you can learn from this. Uh, again, we'll be meeting next week. And uh, we want to invite you as a watcher or a listener to join us at, um, um, give, me, give me the link again, if you don't mind. Mike, it's, uh, well, you, if you go to YouTube, just type in micro giants uh, and then put mentoring after it. That's the best keyword to get there. We're on top. Cool. 
Thank okay. you very much, Ed. Thanks, Ron. Thanks much. Thank good you. Seeing you guys again. You uh, good show. Appreciate it. Bye.